Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Kanchi Batra. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first episode of Agribusiness Enclave 2022, brought to you by The Diplomatist and Business of Agriculture. The theme for this discussion is food processing and agribusiness. Three months back, our team was planning to have a physical on-site event, but as the country witnesses another wave of COVID-19 cases, we had to shift to the virtual platform. Nevertheless, we shall try to have an event late in March if the situation permits. We are equally pleased to have TIFFs, Trade and Investment Facilitation Services by PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry as our knowledge partner. They are committed to facilitate firms across the globe for trade and investments in India. Now, the role of agriculture in the growth of Indian economy and the overall development hardly needs any elaboration. It is true that because of the demographic environment in India, food processing industry has a, has a bright future. Also, this industry is in transformation mode. Food processing combined with marketing has the potential of solving the basic problems of agricultural surpluses, wastages, rural joblessness and better remuneration to the farmers all over the world. Today's session can be actively attended live or watched in replay to bring you answers on hot agribusiness questions delivered by our panel of speakers with experts and senior advisors. The objective of this discussion is to have a dialogue to discuss the latest trends and offerings which would help all the stakeholders for the overall development of the food processing industry in India and other parts of the world. The deliberations will also identify the scope of cooperation with different regions in areas relating to food processing industry and to understand India's vision, strategy and action plan. We are indeed grateful to Ambassador Anil Trigunayat for yet another association through this important dialogue. Ambassador Trigunayat is a member of the Indian Foreign Service. He has served in the Indian missions in Cote d'Ivoire, Bangladesh, Mongolia, USA, Russia, Sweden, Nigeria, Libya and Jordan. Now, before I hand over to the chair, I wish you all a most successful webinar and look forward to open and constructive debates. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Batra, uh, for that kind introduction. And you have already set the tone uh, to exactly what we are going to discuss today. And we have an excellent panel of experts uh, who will be telling us in detail exactly how things are moving, how they have moved, especially in the food processing sector. What are the opportunities? What are the glitches? And which are the markets, especially in Africa? How can we collaborate a little more with them? Because today, the value chain uh, in the food processing industry has really been infested or a huge investment has been made into technology. Uh, I remember that many years ago when India embarked on its economic reforms program, uh, we nearly, we are the largest producers maybe of fruits and vegetables or second largest, but nearly 30, 40% of that went waste and was not even processed properly. We were not nowhere near uh, exporters of uh, uh, flowers or other things. I mean, and eventually over time, uh, as the Green Revolution and other revolutions took place in India became self-sufficient in food, uh, it has started exporting to various countries. And uh, despite the fact that we are doing too good, we have a huge population, one sixth of the world. Obviously, this is an area in which there would be a requirement of constant investment, technology upgradation, uh, better market practices, uh, and above all, our distribution networks. So th all these are extremely important uh, from our uh, perspective and to understand. India's uh, food exports last year uh, went up uh, to 38.6 billion uh, despite the pandemic. And as we know that even though the pandemic is there, but the food sector is one in which things continue to to remain upbeat along with the pharmaceutical sectors. Another dimension that opened was that the herbal segment uh, is beginning to contribute about 30% of the nutraceuticals, which is a very welcome change and a welcome development. We hope that 
India will grow uh, as far as the food processing uh, industry, food exports are concerned, both packaged and uh, otherwise, uh, we would be uh, doing reasonably well in the uh, and have greater global market share uh, as well. Now, the, there are uh, people who will be attending who are interested in exporting their products. Some of them are already doing so. So they would be interested in certain um, uh, technicalities of exports. And uh, we have panelists who are experts in that. Now, <clears throat> India has been uh, uh, trying to create an infrastructure in this sector. And uh, you'll be surprised that uh, probably we were one of the first countries which actually had a Ministry of Food Processing Industry. Um, and there was a lady minister at one time, so it, it, it did happen. And so India continues to make a greater focus and it's directly because of the simple reason that the agricultural sector in India employs the largest number of people. You have to look after your own population and try to do as best as one can. Now we are thinking that there, there are some statistics there which I have come across that the government is trying to create a favorable uh, policy ecosystem in the food processing sector uh, so that we can achieve what we want to basically achieve. Today, the annual average annual growth rate, CAGR as they call, is roughly about 8.4% or 8.5%. And uh, uh, the Indian food uh, industry's output by 25, 26 is expected to grow by about $535 billion, which is not a mean achievement, it's a big one. And with the it's lifestyle changes with the rising household incomes, urbanization, we will see a newer kind of a change more into the organic sectors that might uh, uh, become uh, major drivers of uh, the market in the longer term. People are becoming more health conscious uh, in, in that sense. So there are certain changes would be required in the supplies as well for those kind of people. <clears throat> and uh, as we know that the consumption patterns obviously uh, will, uh, will continue to change, but continue to provide a, a market for the upscale products, expensive products. That's what we see today. And therefore with the growing consumption of the food, the industry is approximately as likely to reach up to $1.2 trillion. Uh, so it's just a big uh, thing. And as far as the basics are concerned, I think that everybody knows that India has been um, uh, the first in the livestock population, first in the spice production in the world, first in the milk production in the world, and second producer of fruits and vegetables, as well as second in the food production itself. And uh, uh, also as well as fish and aquaculture, actually on those two dimensions, there is a much greater focus of the government today. And as Prime Minister Modi has often said that he would like to see the income of the farmers to be doubled, so I think that it is not only through growing uh, or uh, cultivating agriculture, it is the, in the value chain that can be generated, the value that can be generated, that is where we are going to see the growth coming and eventually distribution of the wealth for the uh, farmers uh, and uh, the people in the supply chain. And of course the industry as the foreign direct investment into India increases, we'll be seeing greater clusters or food processing parks as these are being planned now, a lot of them. Uh, I think that we are going to look at it from a, a, a holistic perspective. On top of it, there are food security is an extremely important dimension for all the countries. So I believe that uh, apart from India becoming self-sufficient and being export surplus sometime, is also uh, trying to find long-term uh, collaborations, especially in Africa, either bilaterally basis. I mean, I remember when I was hosted in Nigeria, I was also covering Chad. And when we, when we went to Chad, the Chadian president told me that we understand you are so good in agriculture. Why don't you help us? And they gave us a farm and that farm became uh, by some of the Punjabi farmers from Punjab who had come there. They had really created a model farming practices in a place which was completely uh, barren at that time. So India has that potential. India has the pra agronomic practices. We have agricultural research. We have high yield varieties uh, and the correct policy focus. So we need to work together with our partners in Africa and we need to work like that, the localization of production and 
uh, adding value to their products and then uh, be able to export to third countries from third countries to other countries. So I think that there is a tremendous possibility. And now, as you know, that West Asian countries, especially in the Gulf, are very much interested in tying up with India and Israel together to um, work for a mutually advantageous solution in African countries. I look at it from that perspective that this is an industry which is essential. It is an industry which is uh, important for existence and it is an industry of the future. So I'll end there and uh, we have an excellent panel and we'll be depending on them for the guidance and the inputs and then we have certain questions uh, which we'll be asking uh, with our panelists uh, in the end. Uh, so thank you once again, Diplomatist Magazine. Uh, uh, for organizing this very key webinar. And now, first, I would like to invite His Excellency Professor Dr. Ambassador Tal Edgars, Chairman of uh, GBSH Consult Group Worldwide. Uh, floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much, Ambassador Anil. Um, thank you to the diplomatist, Ms. Batra, the rest of my colleagues. It is a most edifying conversation for us to jump in and talk about food security in itself as a large context. But given the much time that we have, I'd like to offer my two cents worth, availability, accessibility, and affordability. Availability is the function of production, utilization, stocks, reserves, and trade, which is both exports and imports. Accessibility comes with a thin distribution system across the entire African population. Now, if you were to study closely the work of Nobel laureate Amir Tassen in his 1981 seminal work, Poverty and Famine, an essay on entitlement and deprivation, he wrote about people being plunged into starvation when their entitlement to food ends. This implied that hunger and starvation resulted from some people not having access to enough food, not because there's not enough food available in a specific country or region, Affordability, meanwhile, is increasing the purchasing power of the rural poor so that they can buy food. So perhaps let's now break down everything into a couple of statistics. India produces massive amounts of cereal and has a huge buffer stock. According to the fourth advance estimates for 2018-2019, released by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, total food production in India stood at 200 tons in 2018 and 2019. The total stocks of wheat and rice held by the Food Corporation of India as of January 1st, 2020 stood at 74.9 million tons as compared to 63.4 million tons as of January 1st, 2019. Even with such huge numbers, however, many people in India go to bed hungry. Although there is food available, the poor cannot afford to buy it. It is not a surprise, therefore, that undernourishment is a fundamental health issue for India. According to a 2019 report from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 194.4 million Indians, or some odd 14.5% of the country's population are undernourished. Let us compare those challenges to what is happening in Africa. The problem gets even more complicated when we speak of Africa. Africa has the potential to not only become self-sufficient in food production, but to serve as a global food basket. With the right support, African countries can leverage their resources, land, water, people, knowledge, and markets to overcome food insecurity and compete in the global food markets. Indeed, a huge 60% of the uncultivated arable land in the world can be found in Africa. Africa has a huge working age population, which is estimated to increase from seven and seven and five, 705 million in 2018 to almost 1 billion by 2030. At present, African food inputs account for 35 billion US dollars per year. This figure is expected to reach 110 billion US dollars by 2025. Such high level of food inputs is detrimental to the African economies and severely affects the African agriculture sector, resulting in many others, the massive export of jobs from Africa. Even assuming, however, if we were to look at it from a very objective view, an average annual population growth of 3%, food production in Africa needs to be increased by 60% from its current levels over the next 15 years. Africa needs to increase its grain production by almost four times and its animal production by seven times given a population 
of 2.5 billion people in 2050. At the same time, it is noteworthy that Africa's food markets encompassing agriculture and agribusiness are valued at $313 billion a year in 2013 could triple by 2030. This means that Africa's farmers and agribusiness could create a trillion dollar food market by 2030. The growth generated by agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa alone is estimated to be 11 times more effective in reducing poverty than GDP growth in other sectors. Agricultural growth has a multiplier effect given that 65% of Africa's labor force is engaged in the agricultural sector. Here's my parting shot before we can get to other areas is the African Development Bank Group estimates that for an agricultural transformation to take place, there is need of 32 to 40 billion US dollars per year for the next 10 years. At present, there is only 9 billion US dollars of financing available per year, leaving a gap of 23 to 31 billion US dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Edgar, this was uh, a very interesting statistics that you put out and I, very, I fully agree with your AAA model, uh, which we often use uh, in terms of the Indian technology, which is affordable, accessible and available. Um, uh, and uh, which has been working very well in, in Africa. And you are absolutely right. I mean, Africa can be the bowl of the food bowl of the world. And uh, that's what uh, uh, we need to work together. I think that the countries that have these agriculture as being one of the, uh, the, the major mainstays of the economy. I mean, today, even though Indian economy has about 14 to 15% contribution from the agriculture, but it employs over 60% of the people. So it's very important that rural industries are also, and same thing applies in Africa. And I think there are tremendous possibilities of working together. We'll come back to you with the questions. And I think there are several of them targeted at you, but thank you once thank again you. for sharing your thoughts. Now thank I would you. like to invite uh, Dr. S.P. Sharma. He is the chief economist and a very well-known personality and working with the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Dr. Sharma, floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me and thank you diplomatist uh, for giving me this opportunity to express uh, the viewpoint of my industry body, PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We are grateful to diplomatist for uh, collaborating with us for, uh, for this program, for the growth and development of the country and for the exchange of ideas. I would like to mention that the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry is uh, 116 years old industry body, which is representing the issues of trade and industry to the various government departments and the state governments for the growth and development of the country and disseminating all the information of the uh, government of India uh, with its policy advocacy to the members of PSD Chamber of uh, Commerce, which are more than uh, uh, 1 lakh and 25,000 right now. Uh, I am representing the PhD chamber as chief economist and uh, deputy secretary general. And uh, uh, I uh, place so many issues of the uh, members to the government, which are related to various uh, different, different segments of the industry. So today's webinar regarding the uh, promotion of trade, regarding the uh, uh, development with the other countries and exchange of ideas and bilateral relations is very, very important at today's juncture where there are so many issues related to the global value chains. And we have to now uh, think about the uh, futuristic growth trajectory of the uh, trade and development across the uh, nations. So I would like to mention uh, a few facts and figures about the uh, recent developments in the uh, area of agriculture and food processing in India and our uh, collaborative efforts and the policy environment undertaken by the government of India uh, during the last uh, few years to uh, support the growth trajectory of the agriculture sector, which is not only the backbone of the Indian economy, but also a major growth driver in today's uh, difficult time. Uh, the role of agriculture and food processing sector remains critical to Indian economy as a large uh, proportion of population still depends on the agriculture directly or indirectly and uh, and uh, uh, enhanced and stable growth of the agriculture and the food processing sector is uh, important not only for generating purchasing power among the rural people but also uh, for the uh, price stability in the economy and uh, for demand generation 
why i am concentrating on the demand, demand gen generation because still uh, more than 50% of the population is dependent on the agriculture sector so clearly 50% demand comes from the um, agriculture sector if the uh, if the agriculture sector is growing and the people uh, income is also growing then then they are able to purchase more and demand is created in the economy and if, if the demand is created then uh, there will be more and more employment opportunities because uh, factories will be able to expand their production possibilities and they will be able to deploy more and more workforce in their factories uh, to fulfill the demand trajectory so agriculture sector overall uh, is backbone uh, for the uh, price stability for the demand creation for the employment generation in the country and and uh, we are happy to note that uh, the share of agriculture sector in india gdp is increasing once again uh, 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 like uh, this was at around 18% in uh, uh, 1920 before uh, corona now this is around 20% uh, in the uh, corona uh, era because the more and more concentration is now on the agriculture sector so that the rural economy is supported adequately uh, to maintain the uh, growth trajectory of the indian economy uh, but the workforce is still dependent on uh, agriculture sector more than 50% workforce is still dependent and i would like to mention that during the uh, corona period uh, last during the last two years uh, though the every uh, segment of the economy was facing a severe uh, hit from the uh, coronavirus because of decelerating demand and uh, there's so many factors but the agriculture sector grew more than 3.5% average during uh, during the last two three years uh, despite the various challenges created by uh, pandemic coronavirus. So the government has announced various reforms during the last few years uh, to boost the growth of agriculture sector, such as one lakh food agri infrastructure fund is there, and then rupees ten thousand food scheme for formalization of micro food enterprises is there. Reforms in essential commodities act have been undertaken. Agriculture marketing and ag agriculture pro uh, produce pricing and uh, quality assurance is also uh, provided and minimum support price is also uh, supported by the government at the rate of 1.5 times of the cost of farm produce and uh, strengthening of the irrigation facilities promoting organic farming enhancing credit for farmers crop insurance timely updates on the weather developments these are the uh, recent developments undertaken by the government to support the farm activity and to support the uh, trajectory of agriculture growth in india and I would like to mention that uh, India is a major producer of several agriculture food items in the world, uh, but, but the processing is not uh, uh, that much lucrative. Uh, uh, processing is less than 10% of the uh, total produce of the agriculture in India. Uh, demand for uh, processed food items is set to increase in the coming times, providing uh, opportunities for great, greater value chains. So we are hopeful that uh, in the coming times, the demand will uh, be there in the uh, food processing sector because uh, now we have introduced so many lucrative policies for the food processing sector and uh, uh, progress uh, uh, over the uh, few years in providing the food security for its people. And uh, 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 because largely uh, we have to focus on the self reliant uh, in agriculture sector, which is the mission of the uh, Indian government to become Atam Nirbhar. Accordingly, the policy focus has shifted from attaining, uh, attaining the self-sufficiency to generating higher stable income for the farming population, but also uh, to become Atam Nirbhar with the support of the uh, various uh, uh, segments and to connect of the various segments of the Indian economy with the agriculture sector. And food processing industry is uh, one area which has the potential to add value to farm output, create alternative employment opportunities, improve exports, and strengthen the uh, domestic supply chains, which are very, very important at this juncture to connect with the global economic environment. Over the years, India has been gradually integrating its agriculture with global markets. And as a result, our exports of agriculture and allied products have been uh, grown significantly. The uh, key agriculture and allied uh, export products from our country are broadly categorized into 43 categories, which include animal uh, casings, alcoholic beverages, basmati rice, buffalo meat, 
cashew, cashew uh, nut um, uh, and uh, uh, castor oil, cereal preparations. So among others, these are the major items which are uh, export, exported to the various markets. It is also uh, important to note that the marine products like uh, uh, milk products and miscellaneous processed items, molasses, um, are the other items which are also in the uh, category of, in the uh, uh, category for the exports and the export trajectory accordingly have have been increased significantly from the uh, lows of the uh, 15 16 or 16 17 now we are very much uh, uh, significant in the export trajectory uh, in the export of agriculture and food products and the exports killed uh, from us dollar uh, 24 billion in uh, 2010 11 to 41 billion in 2021 with an increase of 71% uh, CAGR and the growth rate of 6.1% during the uh, same period. As per the uh, projections made in the agriculture export policy, uh, the agriculture exports would increase from the present value uh, to US dollar 60 billion uh, in the next few years and uh, uh, will become 100 billion in the next five years. So we are very, very optimistic in the agriculture and food products, but still we are uh, very meager in the global imports of uh, agri and food products, which is, uh, I believe uh, we are at around 0.5% uh, of the uh, total uh, world agri and food imports, uh, dollar 40 billion dollar uh, becomes uh, less than 0.5% of the uh, 1300 billion agri and food imports in the uh, uh, in the world. So uh, uh, we have to uh, go a long way to enhance the trajectory of exports and to become a 100 billion uh, uh, export um, economy in the agri and food products with a lot of reforms by the government and uh, support from the government uh, to the farmers and uh, 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 in terms of credit facility and uh, uh, minimizing the vestiges because vestiges is a major area of concern for the uh, agri sector in India, uh, uh, and these there are estimates that more than 25% of the agri products are wasted. So if we are able to uh, reduce this wastage from 25% to around 10%, that will be a great uh, uh, support to the agriculture economy and to increase the income of the farmers, which will again multiply the uh, incomes and uh, make it more and more attractive for the global investors to invest in the global uh, in the India's uh, agri supply chains uh, in terms of the agri infrastructure like uh, uh, cold chain, uh, uh, warehousing, uh, storage, uh, and, and agri infrastructure like uh, uh, rural roads. So uh, all these developments are going to make India a major uh, attractive destination uh, for the global investors to invest more and more in India, the agriculture sector. And we are hopeful and uh, we are sure that uh, our agriculture sector uh, will become a major growth driver once again uh, to push the growth trajectory of the Indian economy in the double digits in the next few years. So with these words, I would like to stop here and uh, uh, I would uh, love to have questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for <clears throat> putting everything into perspective as far as the sector is concerned. Um, and, and you rightly mentioned that uh, the uh, the contribution of uh, agriculture sector to the GDP in the last few years has increased, and this is one sector along with the pharmaceuticals and chemicals which has done reasonably well uh, during the pandemic as well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, you mentioned about the government policies because an ecosystem is the most important thing for anything to be done, whether it is domestic production. Uh, taking it to the markets or to the export market. So that's all the government is very much uh, uh, working on it. And those are the kind of policies that have been announced recently, incentives that have been announced. Those are very, very important. Uh, and um, how the, uh, the self-sufficiency or Atmanirbhar, as we say, because today the Atmanirbhar concept has changed from simple self-sufficiency to connecting with the markets, global markets. So local to global, like that kind of a thing, which is uh, continuing. And of course, our target is good, $100 billion uh, by 2030. But <clears throat> I believe that the wastage is something which you mentioned and has always been a major problem. And I think that is something uh, will, uh, will have to be addressed uh, in order to acquire the kind of efficiencies we need in the system. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, we'll come back to you with the questions. 
And Thank now I'd like to request Mr. Bright Laka. He is the founder and CEO of RUDAG. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good day once again um, to um, Ambassador Anil. Um, and uh, to um, thank you, thank you to Kanchi uh, the, um, for, 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 for this, for this, for this invite to be part of this panel. And um, thank you to all the, the esteemed panelists. Um, so maybe let, let me just give you a bit of um, 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 uh, background. RUDAG, RUDAG is, uh, is, is an abbreviation. Um, so it basically stands for Rural Development Alliance Group, right? So, 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 so we, we as, as an entity, we play in the space of um, uh, agricultural development um, within rural areas. And I'll get back to that um, and as to why we're doing that. But firstly, I would like to, to just share um, a few of my thoughts. And I'm happy that um, um, Ambassador Edgars did touch on quite a number of statistics for both India and Africa. And one wonders why are we still struggling, you know, particularly in, in, in Africa. Why are we struggling while we still have, we have, you know, the assets or the resources in terms of land, the resources in terms of water, the resources in terms of labor. Why are we still lagging behind in terms of, um, you know, food security, whereas we have such beautiful God given resources. And, um, you know, um, the World Bank estimates that when compared to other, um, you know, uh, sectors, uh, growth in agriculture is two to four times more effective in reducing poverty. And the significance of that sector is further reinforced by the fact that the sector employs two thirds of Africa's labor and accounts for almost one third of um, the continent's um, GDP. And there's, there's quite, a, quite, quite, quite a scope for, for, for that to increase or to grow further. But we're sitting with, 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 with um, you know, three key challenges, particularly in Africa. One of those challenges is that access to, to, to we always complain about having access to market, um, access to finance and access to, to, to technology. Now this, this um, 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 currently present opportunity for collaboration to address those three challenges. I want to put uh, to scale it down down to South Africa and give you just paint a picture of where the challenges lie. For an example, in South Africa, we have um, we spend about 250 to, to 300 billion rands just on social on social development on grants. And one wonders why are we still doing that if we want to you know create um, 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 sustainability within which our communities um, um, are living. So, 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 so then there's three questions that one asks. The first question is why? The why question then boils down to resources. We are still, as, as an African continent, we are still um, you know, held up in the traditional way of doing farming. And we are held up in that simply because of the accessibility to, to modernize resources. Number two, as because Agriculture hasn't, hasn't gotten to a point where it's much more attractive to, you, to, to youth, hence this lack of interest for youth to participate in the field, in the field of agriculture. And that is then compounded by the fact that we have an aging, aging population in agriculture. Um, and most of the agricultural development that were developed many years ago are just going down simply because there's no one taking over. There's no, there's no, um, um, uh, um, sustainability of, 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 of such uh, agricultural programs. The second one is the how, which then comes down to, 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 to collaboration, which um, Ambassador Anil did state to it. It is important for us to realize the importance of um, the values that we add into, 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 into India and Africa in terms of collaboration. And collaboration could be either in investment side could be either on the on the on the on the technical development side as well as as well as as, as well as as well as mentoring and i'm sitting here today um with my understanding that india has actually much more advanced in 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 in, in technology in farming that with such kind of experience and knowledge we should then take advantage of the relationship that we already have uh then we impart such knowledge with 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 with, with africa for us to realize 
um, all our potential um, 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 combined. The, the last one, which is the when. And I define the when as, a, as, 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 as action. Um, we, we, we tend to be sitting in, in, in meetings and discussing what is it we want to do without really emphasizing the importance of taking action of the things, of the outcomes that we, that we, that we, that we get to. It's important that we get to a point where we're saying we have identified X, Y, Z in Africa, or we have identified X, Y, Z in India. How do we then move forward? When do we move forward? Let us, let us, let us, let us have actionable, you know, um, uh, um, um, points that one um, understands and knows that they need to be, you know, executed. Correct. So, 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 I want to go back to the issue where Africa keeps on saying we do not have the market, right? Already, I've given an example of, of, of South Africa with the social development, where the, the procurement spend on, 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 on nutrition and many other things. Um, it's over the region of about just over a quarter of a billion, about 250 billion rands, right? We have, we have um, our own government um, institutions that are procuring um, food commodities from different or just a few of the elite, of the elite FMCG companies, right? We have the vast land, we have the, we have the numbers in terms of labor, but we're not taking, taking advantage of that. It is important that we, with that being said, we, for, we, we really punt on skills development, on education, on technical um, 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 empowerment within the space at which we, 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 we participate. Um, we, 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 have, we have the school feeding programs. And the examples that I'm giving that are South African are not only limited to South Africa. They actually are across the entire continent. Now you sit back and start thinking, how do I then tap into such markets? How do I then, how do I then empower the communities to participate in such um, um, uh, um, 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 markets or other value chains in, in general? So, so I thought I should paint that picture so that when we engage, we know where exactly we need to start where we, know, we exactly need to, what is it we exactly want to achieve? And um, Ambassador Anil, I actually liked the idea of um, the food um, processing parks. Um, it is, it is, I think it is, it is quite an, an excellent uh, program that we have. Um, and one would, want, would really want to um, get to know more about it and take it forward. I think that's it from my side and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Laka. That was uh, very, very interesting and you really put your finger on the nerve, uh, exactly how the access to markets, finance, and technology. Those are the three major problems which are everywhere, apart from small holdings. Especially in India's case, the problem is of also small holdings. So we need to work some kind of a cooperative mechanisms. You know, in India, when we had the white revolution that happened, that was actually as a result of Amul, which is now a multinational corporation, uh, or that was one of the uh, famous examples which has really worked that small producers can come together and can create a viable uh, supply chain uh, across the country and in the world. And I think that um, so your, your points are absolutely essential. But another thing that you mentioned, which I did not know really, of course, we have the youth is not that much interested in going back uh, to the fields unless you make it Texan style of farming, you know, attractive, uh, which we had in certain parts of India from where I come coming from the agricultural background uh, in Tarai areas of India, uh, where we have these uh, good sized farms and technologically very advanced too. So <clears throat> the youth's disinterest is very, uh, a, a very important thing. And how do you take them back is only through by way of technology and by way of making it productive and meaningful for them. Because very often uh, they, it is easier to go and uh, take up a job and start working. And that's what has been happening. So more industries, food processing industries especially, must be nearer the areas where the good production pockets are there uh, in the agriculture, then that would provide uh, a better integrated infrastructure development. So it's just absolutely uh, bang on on this and uh, modernizing the agriculture is I think uh, one of the ways uh, in which things could move and I, I'll, uh, we'll, someone in the panel would always speak about the food parks and but of course all this information is available. The government of India has now as a, as a another innovative practice is trying to work on this creating food parks <clears throat> and the logistical supply chains for the farmers exactly. 
you know, if the farmers can't come to the marketplace, the marketplace has to go there. And now <clears throat> in India, we have also started uh, online marketing. Uh, some portals have been created, which is called Enam and others. And I'm sure there's a question and I think Dr. Sharma will be able to tell us a little more about that. Now, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Uh, now I would like to um, invite Mr. Nitin Aras and uh, he's a business uh, mentor and uh, heads the Procon Venture. Uh, Mr. Aras, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Anil. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma, Mr. Laka and Mr. Edgar. Thank you to Diplomatis and Kanji that uh, they have given me an opportunity to you know, have a dialogue with you. But most of the subjects you have covered, almost Dr. Sharma already uh, given all the statistics about this Indian, Indian scenario. So uh, basically I am an engineer, mechanical engineer, and uh, uh, right now I'm mentoring to the uh, new entrepreneurs who are coming into this industry, particularly in the food industry. So I'm having almost experience of uh, 17 to 18 years in the food industry, and uh, I already worked out with a lot many countries in the Africa. Like we have supplied plant to this Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, uh, Kenya. So we have the installations at the different area for the food processing. And I'm well aware about this, you know, agro-commodity uh, portion over there in Africa. Particularly, the situations are almost like everywhere, uh, uh, honestly telling. Uh, it may be at a, with a lesser impact in uh, Europe or America. Uh, India is one of the part. Africa may be uh, behind than India. But everywhere, the problem is almost same. So uh, I just uh, wish to, you know, uh, highlight these kind of things as in perception of an engineer. So basically, the problem is that one is that uh, how to add the value to the agro products and how it can be used to the end consumers. Preservation technologies we are lagging here. As Dr. Sharma mentioned, that wastage is there almost 27%. If it, is bring, if it brings down to the 10% level, it will help us uh, to the society. Similarly, there are some problems with the producers and uh, they are not getting the right price and consumers also not getting the value for the money. Manpower efficiency we are not used, utilizing. Similarly, we are not having the employment. So employment problem is there. So, so overall is that if we, if we focus on this food industry, which is you know fast consumable goods, so it will create a better opportunity to the world in all the aspects. Basically, there is a gap between the uh, producers and pro to the end users. These are the gaps uh, rightly mentioned by the Dr. Sharma. That is the storage is their uh, problem. Gap is there. Distribute, we don't have the distribution uh, right, uh, distribution at the right place. Wastages are there. We are not having the right processors who can, you know, you uh, add the value to the uh, farming products. Uh, we have hardly, we are hardly 10 to 12 percent uh, agri agriculture product we are, you know, processing in India. If, if, we, if we have the processing facilities which can go up to the 25 to 30 percent, even in the next five years, we can save a lot of the foods and we can, you know, uh, uh, we can utilize these foods for the food security in the different region of the world. Here, one is one of the part which is, I feel that uh, PPP model is most important, like public-private partnership model. If we have this PPP model in food processing, definitely we will have the right corporate approach with the support of the government. And uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, have a right kind of distribution to the product to the, directly to the end user. The rural area, basically, we are not focusing, uh, still we are not focusing in the rural areas uh, where we can think about the development of, you know, uh, micro and small entrepreneurs. Now I'm telling you, these are the basically uh, opportunities which are coming, coming up in India, like uh, UAE. UAE, uh, India and UAE having the uh, food corridor. We have signed the agreement in the December of 2020, where UAE already announced that US dollar 7 billion investment will be in India. They are focusing on involvement of the contract farming at larger scale. So, you know, they can have the practices right from the beginning 
how to uh, cultivate the crops and how to harvest it they are interested in food supply chain to connect food supply chain to connect uh, our state four states particularly mp chatisgarh up and punjab then there is another focus from the ue food corridor that is the eight large scale food processing units they are going to develop in uh, our my state that is uh, madhya pradesh mp they basically why they are investing this much the major focus that is the development of the mega food park warehousing hubs contract farming and and related infrastructure to get you know uh, the to uh, to get the food security in the middle east or uae this is their main objective that is why they are investing this much amount in india second opportunity which is coming up that is the italian food park Italian already uh, launched their mega food park as a pilot project here in India, and they wanted to have particularly creation of the world class facilities for the food processing in India. They wanted to develop the synergy between agriculture and industry uh, between the two countries. They also wish to have the research and development of the new product and efficient technologies in the food sectors. so these are the basically challenges which we are having in uh, near future so we wish to have the different kind of master plans particularly uh, one master plan i wish to focus and uh, i i wish to uh, elaborate here number one is the infrastructure development such basically warehousing distribution and connectivity to the ports number two i wish to have a stringent rules and regulations for the safe and hygienic food processing units we wish fsai and hsf that annual audit should be mandatory in each and every food industry so that we can control on the uh, food category basically food safety world class laboratories uh, if we have in each state we can address the you know uh, address the issues related to the food safety and hygiene at every state and at every level easily warehousing for the food and grains at panchayat level basically we have the small uh, we have the villages and there we have the panchayat so we wish to have at least one warehouse should be there so it can cater the services to the you know 25 km areas so all the farmers from the 25 km areas they can stock their uh, product or food in, in the particular warehouse and the next most important thing that is the system based dedicated expo system if we have so we can have the hassle free operations for exporting of the food right food of outside but this is not the end basically uh, if we talk about how to achieve this so there is one most important part that is the skill development if we have the right skill at the right place definitely we will go for the right food definitely we can you know uh, generate the right food we can add the value to the food right value to the food so skill development is the major lagging area here and almost everywhere uh, in india particularly in the food processing so here we wish to have at least one institution not only the cftri or niftem only if we have the different uh, universities come up and they can have or they can open their uh, skill development area particularly for the food processing then we can you know cater this uh, uh, we can cater uh, a right human power to the food processing industry in india so these are the basically focusing areas where we can if we work if we work uh, if we focus uh, to implement all these practices here then definitely we can overcome the all the challenges and certainly we will have the plenty of food which we can uh, you know use for the food security for the different part of the world i submit my here thank you thank you mr ras uh, you made some excellent points especially the way forward what should be the <clears throat> the road map uh, to to move forward and they absolutely correct i mean skill development you mentioned uh, unfortunately in india what we miss is uh, very much that between the industry and the academia there is no linkage we need to create some kind of a, a mutually sustaining programs which is done in many countries i've been in sweden and elsewhere where industry and 
the universities or the academia, they have dedicated programs in certain areas. So you do that and they become the sort of a crucible for new technologies, uh, ad adapted technologies, which are possible. So you are absolutely right. Uh, skill development is very, very important, of course, because if you need to move to the next level of value chain, you need to uh, inject technology, which starts from A to Z. Everything has to be done in that. And your, your proposal about the, uh, that we should have warehousing at the panchayat level is, of course, as I mentioned, that they have to go there. The problem is storage, transportation. All these, uh, we may talk about the cold, um, cold chain storages and all, but still there is that problem. But one of the most important things we want to get into the export market is the quality control. And that is something that's where sometimes when I was trade commissioner in New York, I remember that some of sometimes our prawns and all that we were exporting were just rejected by them for no rhyme or reason very often. Uh, and we thought that we have already done these export inspection agencies have done the job, but apparently it was not to the mark. So the client is the king. So one has to work on that as far as the export market is concerned. Uh, you mentioned about the UAE. I mean, that is, uh, of course, the, as I said, the Gulf countries are very keen and they want to collaborate with India, but unfortunately the contract farming in India is a bit difficult uh, because of the holding uh, and the agriculture sectors per se. So, but the government is trying to work on these kind of mega food parks and others. And let's hope uh, this works out what we have seen recently uh, the, the recent farmer agitations and all that have shown you. So there were supposed to be certain reforms that would have helped the industry a great deal, including the agriculture, but somehow the politics has played out there. Um, and uh, same thing about Italians. I mean, in fact, uh, Italians owe this much to us because a large number of Indian farmers are working in Italy. And those in, in the farming sec agriculture sector the maximum people working there uh, are from India and in, in, in Italy itself. So I'm happy that they are working on these uh, in the food sectors and creating the food parks. So thank you so very much for focusing. It has been a very comprehensive uh, discussion uh, by everyone. Now we have certain questions which we received earlier. So now maybe I would, uh, first question I'll pass, pass to Dr. Sharma because it relates to the government's policies. So it says that we intend to know the changes in the government policy that affect import export of agri products. This is by Mr. Datta Prasad Shirgurkar, assistant professor in Go from Goa. Uh, of course, you touched upon these, and maybe the second question could also be uh, used. You could take because it relates to APIDA and MPDA that with whom uh, you work. How can agencies like APIDA and MPDA specifically contribute? to establishing and enhancing the capacity of food processing units. And probably Mr. Aras also can pitch in into that. Uh, in African partner countries, also advice on setting up and upgrading cold storage infrastructure in these countries. This is one of our former ambassadors uh, who was there, I think in uh, Niger or somewhere, Mr. Menon. So let's start with these two questions. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, professor, sir, for uh, uh, for your questions, um, I would like to mention that uh, government of India uh, aims to boost the export growth trajectory of the agriculture and food processing sector uh, by leveraging so many reforms, such as uh, there are reforms for the 100% foreign direct investment in marketing of uh, food products and various incentives. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, from the central government and state governments have been given with a strong focus on supply chain infrastructure. And uh, uh, to develop the supply chains, uh, uh, there are so many schemes by the central and state governments you can go through. And I will uh, also for, can forward uh, the same to you on your email ID. The government has, uh, recently government has established 18 mega food parks and uh, 134 cold chain products to develop the food processing supply chain so that uh, uh, our exports uh, are supported by the competitiveness and uh, uh, wastages are reduced and the price cost margins of the producers in the agri and food products uh, are uh, uh, intact. Uh, and the scheme was also rolled out with the, the amount of 10,000 crore US dollar, 1.3.5 uh, uh, billion to uh, place the food processing sector on a high growth uh, trajectory. 
and the ministry of food and uh, food processing launched the capacity building uh, component of the pradhan mantri formalization of the micro food processing enterprises scheme pm fme scheme and uh, gis uh, one district one product scheme uh, digital map of india which provides details information of the udap and the uh, product specializations uh, to become more and more competitive uh, so the ministry of uh, food processing industry uh, is very keen on developing an integrated and comprehensive national food processing policy um, and they have already uh, drafted for which they are projecting that uh, we will achieve a 100 billion dollar destination in the next few years uh, in the next 3 4 3 years uh, so uh, these are the macro level reforms and uh, broad reforms uh, and there are a lot of uh, micro reforms also which can be uh, checked from the uh, various documents of the government of india and the state governments thank you mr aras would you like to add anything to this yeah exactly particularly related to this you know skill development program somebody asked mr dilbag singh asked for this exactly so uh, there are so many you know initiatives taken by the central government and state government i can put one example of sedmap sedmap it's a basically center for entrepreneurship develop entrepreneurs development program that is from the uh, government of mp recently we uh, you know uh, we uh, had a program for the skill development particularly in the food sectors uh, that is in uh, uh, jabalpur area and in the indor area devas area uh, like uh, odop uh, one district one product one district one product these these are every district is having their own product you know agricultural right. commodity that has been identified by the government of india so government is focusing on these kind of uh, if you are coming up with such type of uh, industry food processing industry which can utilize particular this product like uh, in indore and devas that is a potato so if you are coming up with the industry uh, who can process the potato in different shape or different uh, product so you 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 are entitled for uh, you know different policies from the government like subsidy is there capital subsidy is there then uh, uh, another if you are coming up with the odo then there is a 10 lakhs rupees subsidy is there for the micro industries so these are the initiatives taken by this government and there are definitely uh, uh, sad map a center for entrepreneurship development if you ask them to have an have a program for the farmers and food processors definitely they will plan it and uh, definitely they will provide all the solutions to the people yeah thank you thank you mr ras the next two questions are basically um, of course uh, maybe perhaps taken by uh, ambassador adgar and uh, mr lakka uh, they want to know what regarding processing for medicinal and aromatic crops like those are also a strength of africa uh, as well as in india and the second is what tangible achievements have materialized as a result of south africa india cooperation on food security thank you so much ambassador neil once again and um i think it would be it would be a challenge not just looking at that but looking at what has led to the partnership between india and africa as of 1960 india and south africa and of course all african states had enough food in reliability if you were to look at the lecture by dr shashi tarur in the oxford business school as he spoke about the textile industry and the impoverishment of that in the 60s it led india and africa to start creating a hinge of three pillars into what became the partnership which was now no conditionality no prescription of policy and no questioning of sovereignty and that has existed quite often be well in promoting agribusiness so if you are to look at how india and africa have partnered then you'd notice that the government of india has promoted agribusiness in africa in certain components the first one was vocational training institute incubation centers and under this initiative five food processing business incubation centers in countries have been set up like ghana cameroon angola mali and uganda the government of india has also proposed setting up food testing laboratories in countries like nigeria zimbabwe gambia rwanda and the republic of congo with the international crops research institute for the semi arid tropics as the implementing agency the labs have already been set up in nigeria and zimbabwe of course work is still underway in the other three countries then there's the soil testing and soil health card now this was launched in 2015 providing soil health cards to farmers the card carries crop wise recommendations on nutrients and fertilizers required for farms 
of various soil types. Countries like South Africa and Kenya have already established those soil testing laboratories. Now, in totality, if you were to look at the trilateral cooperation, civil society partnerships, and multilateral cooperation, apart from bilateral partnerships with African nations through training programs, providing soft loans in agriculture and allied sectors, the government of India is also engaging in trilateral partnerships to ensure food security. So you can notice the interventions in India, Brazil, South Africa Fund, as well as trilateral cooperation between the Indian Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, the National Institute of Agricultural Extension Management and the United Nations, the USAID program to train agricultural practitioners from African countries on specialized practices to improve income and productivity. Now the target countries for the initiatives were Kenya, Liberia and Malawi during the period of April to November 2018 the MANAGE program completed 24 US India Africa Triangular International Training Programs. So there is so many initiatives that are happening, but one of the things that we have also found quite largely is people are not informed. And why are people not informed is the disinterest and the decentralization of information where people decide we will focus on the opportunities. Talking about a tri-dollar economy and income-based opportunities much more beautiful than looking towards the answers of which quite roughly we have heard from Dr. Sharma, we have heard from Mr. Aras. These are all opportunities that are there, but before you can hinge on the opportunities, you need to understand the programs that are there. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. That was really um, amazing and you have really put together. I don't know if uh, in Government of India, we have such a comprehensively uh, collected information in one place. <laughs> you've done a, a uh, Mr. Laka, would you like to add something to it? Yes, just just th th thank you, Ambassador. Um, an additional herbs another. Anil. Yeah. So so on the on the on the um, um, medicinal uh, plant side in Africa, there's um, I believe there's a there's 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 a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot of value that needs to be untapped. Um, at this point in time, um, you know, um, most of the medicinal plants are just growing are just growing. This. No, no one is really taking care of, you know, um, um, uh, the plants. But we need to get to a point where we really start realizing the value, both for medic medicinal purposes and for nutrition, because they carry such um, amounts of um, um, value in terms of nutrition and medicinal herbs. Uh, and 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 this would I would really um, link or tie this to what Mr. Nitin Aras mentioned earlier about the infrastructure master plan. In, in, in those type of master plans, these are some of the things that you need to look at. How do we then get to, um, you know, um, get the people of Africa to start commercializing uh, their natural resources? In this case, it will then be um, the medicinal plant that just grows without any effort being made. Um, how do you then get to, to, to you know, um, process them, add value to them, brand them, get them to a commercial state, get them into their markets? I think in a nutshell, that's, that's, that would be my, my comment to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laka. And there is in the uh, chat box, there is a comment on your presentation by Mr. Tisho, Tisho Lopele Aksane. Yes. He says that I concur that the agriculture industry is not appealing to you. However, I believe this pooling curriculum, particularly in South, can play a pivotal role in circumventing South Africa circumventing this challenge. And that's very true, in fact. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I can tell you something very interesting from my own area, which was agricultural essentially. It's a Parai uh, in the Uttar Pradesh state, now it's Uttarakhand. Um, we, when we had the first university, which was Pantanagar Agricultural University, uh, when it was set up, you know, it changed the whole gamut of the farmer's way of looking at it, of course, from cash crops down to the other crops and the, the agronomic practices, the high variety seeds and all. So all their things happens at the same time, there were all these uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, people were trained into agriculture and into animal husbandry and all the dimensions uh, essentially of that. So there has to be a focused approach, of course. And uh, that is very uh, precisely, and as, uh, and as Edgar also mentioned about the various institutions, Mr. Aras mentioned, about various institutions that are working in these areas. So I think the same way, it's absolutely correct that the skill development and the interest 
from the schooling because at the end of the day, everybody has to eat something and you can only produce and then only you eat. So there has to be a significant number of people. Fortunately in India, we have still about 50, 60% of the population dependent on agriculture to the great extent. I think that, um, I, I don't know if there, there is one more question from Mr. Dilbak Singh. I don't know if Dr. Sharma would like to take it. Uh, it's about the ENAM platform. If you would like to inform about that a bit or Mr. Haras, whoever wants to take it. Um, well, um, ENAM is agriculture national uh, agriculture marketing platform. It is an e-platform that has been created by the government of India, uh, in which the farmers, the producers, uh, everybody can put in the information that they want, uh, and they can get actual uh, in real time uh, the interest. And it uh, works as an exchange, uh, basically, both for ex uh, tra transactions and uh, as well as for so it is. An attempt is working very uh, in an excellent way in the last few years. It has shown uh, that a lot more and more farmers, I don't know exactly the numbers, uh, but large number of farmers have uh, registered with this platform. So it's, it's a newer way of uh, procuring and marketing uh, the, the agricultural produce. So I think that uh, I don't see any more questions. So I would pass. Uh, to Kachi Batra and I, on my side, I would like to really express my gratitude to each one of you for really enlightening everyone. And I think uh, the more people are uh, watching it on the YouTube and other platforms and will be this will be shared by Ms. Batra with, and all of us eventually uh, to a larger clientele because uh, there have been very, very significant and concrete critical information that each one of you have provided and would be very much useful for those who are in this area. And there have been some suggestions for the government also, uh, which I hope that uh, Ms. Batra will be able to share it with the concern uh, as per the recommendations. And thank you once again uh, for joining us today. And it's been my absolute pleasure to be with you all. Thank you, Ambassador Tribunayat. I would like to now express my sincere appreciation to all of you who have generously helped us to make this event come together to become a success. Thanks to each and every one of you for being here with us today. Uh, on behalf of my publisher, I thank you for joining us. To our esteemed speakers and chair, Ambassador Tribunayat, His Excellency, Professor Dr. Ambassador Tal Edgars, Dr. S.P. Sharma, Mr. Bright Laga, and Mr. Nitin Aras. Thank you for bringing your expertise and experience around the table and for engaging all of us in such a fruitful, constructive and open exchanges. I would also like to inform that the second episode of Agribusiness Conclave will take place on 27th of January. It will focus on sustainable agricultural mechanization. Till then, stay tuned. Thank you so much.